Hello, I'm Dr. Hannah Garvin. I am one of the many researchers here at the Neurobiology of Language Lab at Radboud University. We study how the brain, the neurobiology, processes language. We want to know how the brain gets from intention to articulation and how from hearing speech to understanding intention. We can compare this to a bunch of people who want to know how a car can get from standing still to driving around. One major advantage is that they can just lift the hood and see the parts moving. Now we can open up a skull, but they will only show us this gray blob that we call the brain, and it doesn't show us how it comes from intention to articulation. So how can we figure out what the brain does? Pioneers in our fields are neurologists from the 18th century who were able to examine patients with specific speech deficits. After their deaths, the neurologist examined their brain to determine exactly where the speech deficits were coming from. Paul Broca described patients who could only say very few words. He also described a lesion in a very specific part on the left side of their brain. Here you see a clip with a patient with the type of language problems described by Paul Broca. Um, I, I, well, I do. And what do you do now? Um, voices of hope, aphasia. And what is Voices of Hope? Um, Peter Berg, um, Peter Berg, um, and, um, Dr. Hinckley, and, um, and, um, myself, um, founder. Another neurologist, Carl Wernicke, described patients who were very fluent in speaking, but who had much difficulty understanding. He described lesions also on the left side of the brain, but just a bit more to the back. And what were we just doing with the iPad? Uh, right at the moment, they don't show a darn thing. <laughs> <laughs> with the iPad that we were doing? We, from, like, here? I'd like my change for me and change hands for me. It would happen. I would talk with Donna sometimes. We're out with them. Other people are working with them with them. I'm very happy with them. Good. This girl was really good and happy when I played golf. So this research has shown us that certain areas of the brain have very specific tasks in processing language. Comparable to how in a car some parts are for starting movement and others are for giving direction or for stopping movement. However, for this type of research, you need to have a damaged brain and a patient that you can observe both alive and deceased. But of course we also want to know how a healthy brain works. So how do we figure that out? We use techniques called neuroimaging. With neuroimaging, you can look at the brain activations during a specific task. For instance, with EEG and MEG, we can measure the tiny electric currents that the active brain areas generate. With MRI, we can look at what areas of the brain are using more oxygen, and what parts of the brain share a fast connection and what parts need many small routes to communicate. Only during stimulation the brain functioning is altered. Or if you use the strongest technique, maybe until 20 minutes after stimulation. Now you might think, well that's interesting, but why would we care how exactly the brain processes language? If it works, it works. Why would we spend money and time figuring out exactly how? Well, the thing is, in order to fix a broken car, you need to be able to determine exactly what the part is that's broken. Just to know it's not driving like it used to is not enough. Similarly, when we have a good understanding of how exactly the brain processes language normally, this helps us to understand when the language system is broken down. For instance, like the patients above, who after a stroke could only say very few words, or for people who have dyslexia or people who stutter, when we understand exactly what's broken and what's still functioning, we can use this information to devise new methods and improve the language for those who need it.